Greetings, PsyQ community, and welcome to today's webinar, Building Better Beings, PsyQ supporting organizations share wellness strategies. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Rachel Self, Senior Medical Science Liaison for Otsuka Neuroscience Medical Affairs. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's exciting discussion. So I'm excited to present our featured speakers for today. We have Dr. Gaurav Agarwal, Associate Professor for the Departments of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Medical Education at Northwestern University. Their Director of Physician Wellbeing for Northwestern Medicine Medical Groups, as well as our PsyQ MDD Section Advisor. We also have Elizabeth Crane, Founder and Chief Vision Officer of It's All Good Here, one of PsyQ's supporting organizations. In addition, we have Dr. Sandra Jane, Adjunct Clinical Affiliate, University of Texas at Austin School of Nursing and co-founder of Wild Five Wellness, another of our PsyQ supporting organizations. In addition, we have Marjorie Morrison, CEO and co-founder of PsychHub. Dr. Rakesh Jan is unfortunately not able to join us today, but we will hopefully hear from him very soon about some insights regarding wellness. Next, we have Jennifer Rothman, Senior Manager for Youth and Young Adults at the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI. And last but not least, for certain, we have Hannah Zeller, Program Manager for the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, or DBSA. This is a truly phenomenal panel. We're very excited to hear from each of you and truly honored for you to share your time and perspectives today. The work that each of you are doing as well as the work that's being done by your organization is really paramount in moving the needle for mental health um, and changing so many aspects of care, all the way from access, understanding treatment choices, providing peer support opportunities, eradicating stigma, and the list can go on and on, but we want to hear from you all. So let's jump right into our discussion for today. This program is paid for by Otsuka as well as Lumbeck, and the speakers are paid consultants for Otsuka and Lumbeck. Thanks, Rachel. Appreciate the introduction um, and really excited to be here with everyone today. I think, you know, if we, we reflect upon our title of Building Better Beings, we have to think about that in the sense of what is everyone's accountability to do that. And so, you know, as a coach, as a therapist, a psychiatrist, I, I obviously believe that we all have accountability to our own wellness. But if we're really going to talk about building better beings, there has to be a societal value around that. There has to be an organizational commitment uh, in our workplaces around creating the conditions to be able to have better beings. And I think for us, having frameworks that guide that development uh, can be useful. And so we present today this idea of uh, prevention at various levels, primordial, primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, so that we really can make sure that we are providing resources at each level of those preventative aspects to be able to create better beings. You know, I'm really heartened in terms of a silver lining of the last two years in terms of the focus on primordial prevention as we understand better the social determinants of health from a societal perspective. And, and you know, for me, prevention is far better than treatment uh, in our world. And so thinking of, about those social determinants of health at that primordial level is critical. Thank you so much, Rachel. I appreciate the kind introduction. And G, thank you for getting us started. Uh, I love what you said about building better beings. That one's gonna stick with me. Let me just start by saying it is absolutely wonderful to be here with everyone. What a great opportunity and a chance for all of us to talk about wellness, because I know that topic for all of us is near and dear to our hearts. And I would imagine this, that all of us as a group and all of those that are joining us today, if we really think about it, we all consider wellness as our North Star. I love the title of this slide because wellness, whether in the context of clinical practice or just in our own lives, it really is our guiding light, if you will. It directs our steps if we just open up to it and listen to it. And Again, I'll say this, it's what we hope to achieve, not only for our patients, for those of us who work in clinical settings, but for the community at large. And then let's personalize it 
also for ourselves and for all those people that we love and care for. And let me say this, I think it's fair. Wellness, it's not a new thing. I mean, you can look at the slide and let's just listen to what World Health Organization told us. I think their definition came to us in like 1948. So wellness has been around for a very, very long time. So World Health Organization tells us that their definition of health and wellness, I love this, is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It's holistic. It is not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. For me personally, I, I've done a lot of work on my wellness just in making sure that my mental health is stable and that I can continue to take care of my children, uh, be on point with my job, uh, be around for my family. It's, it's very important to me. And I actually, Personally, I was on vacation last week and it was amazing. And, you know, we're always told use that vacation time, use it. And then this week I've been completely swamped. I've been working in the evenings, trying to catch up. And so it's really this catch 22 sometimes with, um, you know, taking that time off and getting that break, but also then the, the follow up and what's left for you when you get home, you need a vacation from your vacation. Um, but for me personally, I, I find that exercise really helps uh, when I can get myself to the gym. I know Sandra mentioned the I'll do extra on Saturday. That's what I've been telling myself this week. I was like, I'll start on Monday. I'll start on Monday. <laughs> um, I've also found you know really being outside and getting grounded, having my feet in the grass, just very simple things like that. And you know, in the moment, if I'm if I'm really starting to feel some stress, whether it's a deadline with work or, you know, my children might be a little irritable that day and I find myself getting stressed out, you know, just taking a moment and breathing and focusing on something different. First of all, thank you so much for having me. I love the great stuff that you do at Psyche, so I'm honored to be included. You know, and I, I'm, I was listening and I'm, you know, listening to Jennifer and she so articulately talks about, you know, her wellness and, and Sandra with the whole journey. And, and I think it's a lot of us that are kind of always overachievers and always looking at what we don't do well, right? I immediately come to this at like, I, like I have the knee jerk reaction of I'm failing. I'm definitely failing in wellness. Like I definitely don't have this down. And I, and I think it's so sad and pathetic that that's that that's the approach I take, and really we have to shift it, right? So some I think part of this is is that wellness looks different and feels different to different people, and so I think that's so important is that I have to stop beating myself up and say, okay, maybe my wellness today isn't what I would want it to be, but it's something, and I have to maybe just look at it like. And I guess that's what I've been trying to do is just to say, this is what it is today. Um, and maybe one day it'll be something totally different, right? But because it's true, we're living in this kind of crazy time. So for me, I, I'm trying and I try really hard to do the exercise every day. Um, and I, I do it with many different people on my watch, right? So I'm one of these Apple watch uh, closing our rings and I have multiple different competitions, but I do it and I've been doing it for probably about a year and a half now, maybe even longer because it holds me accountable to at least have 30 minutes of exercise every day. And it could be a walk, it could be the Peloton, it could be whatever it is. Is, and then I give myself five days a month where I don't even know, no one governs this, I just do. But I, I do it because it's my time and everything else I don't feel like is my time. So, or it is, but it's with, you know, it's for the kids, it's for the company, it's for all the different things that you do. And that's, that, that's like my 30 minutes. So that I think has helped me a lot have to do something for myself. Yeah, I would love to. And I love um, what everyone has shared so far. Um, and bringing to this conversation. And I definitely identify with that feeling of failure. And I think it's very easy for us to tend to feel that way. I think, you know, a lot of us were probably called to work in the mental health space because of personal experience or the experience of one of our family members. Um, so I definitely identify with the lived experience of depression. And, 
you know, especially when COVID was beginning, like I say often to my friends, in January and February of 2019, I felt like something was deeply wrong, you know? And I think what we need to lean into and, and understand is that as people who wanted to work in this field, as people who identify as helper and healer and change maker, this is our superpower, you know, that we can lean into some of our seeing of the dark. You know, Rachel, I love that you say we we don't want to fixate on the dark, but we I think we can see the dark pretty well if we were drawn to this field. So, you know, I, I definitely being around the work all of the time, it can be so um, easy to feel like I'm a failure. I'm not living up you know, to the wellness resources I, you know, help to put out in the world with my organization. Um, but I think, you know, I, I try to take a step back from that. And, you know, I'm thinking like those who cannot do teach, it's, it feels kind of similar. I, I, I fluctuate on how well I'm able to show up for my own wellness. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you for having me on this wonderful panel. You know, I think that what what everyone is saying so far really resonates and that, you know, I think it's part of the human condition to be somewhat hard on ourselves. And, you know, we have that part of us that wants to thrive and, and does thrive and is doing well, but we have that, those parts of our, our mind that'll beat us up and cut us down. And that's sort of a human thing, which is nice because then it's like, welcome to the human race. It's not it's 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 somewhat common if you will and you know my aunt was a nun for 77 years and she would at the end of every phone call say go easy on yourself go easy now and you know i i, I think that's a, a simple thing but just to say that to ourselves is powerful and i i was a psychotherapist for a decade with people living with end-stage cancer you know, for, for, you know, back in the, the 90s. And so many people with cancer taught me that, you know, they really, when you think of, of what they were dealing with, you know, of course they grieved, of course they mourned. That is so important to do. But so many of them focused on what they had with the time they had left versus mm -hmm. on what they didn't have. And they really had this sense of gratitude at the most little things. I remember one man said to me, you know, Elizabeth, have you ever let yourself really taste a glass of water? And I was about to say, yeah. And then he said, no, not until you're dying and you know you're never gonna taste water again, do you realize how magnificent a glass of water is? He said, please, in your life, before you die, start noticing water. And, you know, these kinds of little things that are around us every day. And that really had an impact on me.